Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial. So today what I'm going to be showing you is how you can get the fastest fetch request to return a response from multiple requests. So this is useful when you have the opportunity to download an identical or very similar resource from multiple sources. So for example, it could be a library that is available via several CDN links, or as is the case here, geolocation information based upon a user's IP address. So here I'm fetching from two popular third-party APIs that return information about a user's IP address and current location, and also an API that I set up myself, which is nowhere near as fast as these two dedicated services. So if I run this script a few times in the browser, you see that generally speaking, the API that I set up myself this is the slowest to return a response and the fastest it's a toss up between API 1 and API 2. So the most efficient way to get the data in this example would be to work with API 2, assuming that the response it returns is a successful one. If it isn't successful, then working with API 1 and then only working with my API if the responses from API 1 and 2 are both unsuccessful. So doing it this way ensures that you get the data from the fastest source and also that if one of the sources fails, then you have some backup sources. So let's code that solution now. The first thing I'm going to do is to remove the response handling from each of the fetch requests because we're going to be handling only one response and that's going to be of the fastest fetch of these three. And to prepare the fetch requests to be handled together, I need to place them in an array. So I'll copy the fetch requests into this fetches array and format them like so. And now we're ready to get the fastest fetch request here to return a response. So the method that we're going to be using here is promise.any. So it's located on the native promise object, which can be used to construct new promises. It also has methods on it available to handle promise objects, which is what each fetch request returns. So to handle the fetch request that returns a successful response fastest, you want to pass in the array into promise.any and the return value is a single response that you can handle as if you were making just one fetch request. So I'm going to use original promises syntax here and then I'm going to change it to async await after we've seen this working example. So the data that's coming in in all three cases is JSON. So whatever the response is, I'm going to want to pass it from JSON to a JavaScript object by calling JSON on the response. So I just log the resulting data to the console for now so we can see what it looks like. So let's take a look at the output in the browser. So I'll make this a little bit wider and also zoom out so we can see a little bit more of the object. So for this object that's been returned, the country code is on a property called country code and the IP is on query. Now, an issue is that even though we get back both of these bits of information from each of the responses, the object is not always structured like this. So if we try to request the information again, so this time a different one of the fetch requests was fastest. And as you can see, the object is structured in a different way. So the IP address is now available on an IP property, not query. And the country code is no longer camel case, it's country underscore code. So that means that we have to adapt how we extract data from the object based upon which of the fetch requests was fastest. Now, if the data you are fetching is identical across the fetch requests, then you don't need to do this. You can go straight on to the result handling so for example, if it's a JavaScript library, then you can go ahead and instead of this console log, create a new script element, send it to the DOM, and the moment it hits, it's going to start running the script. This example of the IP addresses gives me the opportunity to show you how to handle data that is similar but different. So to know which of the requests returned the fastest, you can edit the initial response handling because the data is available on the initial response object. So I'm still calling res.json, but I don't want the resulting JavaScript object to be the sole return value that is passed on to the then method that is chained to it. 
So what I'm going to do is wait for the result of res.json within this outer then method. So this does create some nesting that I will be fixing by rewriting with async await after we're done with this example. But for now, I have available to me the initial response object and the data as a JavaScript object inside this function. So I'm going to make the return value of this function an array that contains the endpoint of the fetch request that returned the fastest. So that is available on the initial response object on a property called URL and also the data. So now if I chain another then method on to the end of that one, like this, then I'm going to have available to me the URL that completed the fastest and the data it returned. So what I'm going to do now is to check the value of the first element in the array and then handle the data on that basis. So to get those two values as variables, I'm going to destructure the array. So I call the first value API second object and the array that I'm destructuring is called data. Now what I'm going to do is conditional result handling based upon the value of API. So to speed things along a little bit, I already noted the property values of each of the bits of data on their respective objects. Now what you might find for the value of API is it sometimes has a trailing slash and sometimes not. So to standardize it, we can check if its value ends with a board slash using the ends with method. And if that is the case, then we want to remove that board slash from the end of API. So we can do that with slice, which takes two arguments, the two index values you want to slice between. So this supports negative indexing. So to remove the last character, you can enter minus one. So to overwrite the existing value of API, with this new one, I'm going to ease this assumption that the values of these variables won't change by using let instead. And now by checking the standardized value of API against the endpoints I'm making fetch requests to, I can handle the data appropriately. So if the value of API is equal to the first endpoint, then the data is going to be available. So I log this to the console object query for the IP address and for the country code, it's going to be available on country code as camel case. And then I adjust the properties I'm accessing the other possible outcomes. So if the value of API is the second endpoint, Then again, I'm going to be logging two values to the console, but with different property names. And finally, if the data is coming from my API, which is rare, but we still need to handle that case, then I need to adjust the property names once again. Okay, so hopefully this is a working example now. So if we now take a look in the browser, we are now getting back the data from the API that returns it fastest. Now we can't see which one that is because we're not logging the value of API to the console. So let's do that. And now we'll see the API that is returning the data to us. So the nice thing here is that we're getting the same data back each time, regardless of which API sends us the data. And so if there is a problem with one of the APIs, then we have backups, which you wouldn't have if you were making a single fetch request. So if I deliberately break some of these URLs here, so they are going to fail, we still get the information back from my relatively slow API. So I'll go back and undo that now and show you finally how you can remove this nesting by rewriting this with async await. Now what I'm going to do is to place all of this code inside an async function that is going to allow me to use the await keyword to wait for anything inside there 
which returns a promise. So I'm going to copy all of this, paste it inside the function, and then just clean this up a little bit. So first I'm going to await the result, promise.any, and I'll save that inside a variable called res, as it was inside the original promises syntax. And then I want to await the result of calling res.json, so that returns a promise. So I save that again under the same name as it was before. So I can get the value of API again here by accessing the URL property on the original response object. So again, I'll say API res.url, and then I want to do the standardization again. So I'm just going to copy if statement there. So I'll just fix the indentation here and also delete until that point with the original then syntax. And now you can see that there's no need for creating an array and destructuring here because we've got the value of API here already and we've got the value of the object under the reference data. So I'm going to change that so it's the same as we're querying here. And then all this result handling will work just like it was before. Now in practice, to make your code more maintainable, what you probably want to do is instead of logging these values to the console, return each of these values so that they are the return value of this function and can be used in a, another function. So I'll make these changes to these if statements now. So an async function, it returns a promise. So what we're going to be getting back from this async function is a promise that we can handle in another async function. So I just finish the result handling here before we create that next function. So below, I'll create the function, I'll call it main, that is going to handle the result of calling loader. So loader is returning a promise and save the result of that as res and then log the result of that to the console and I want whatever I'm doing inside main to load immediately on page load. So I'm going to turn that into a self executing function. So now if we take a look in the browser, we are getting the IP address and country code that we can use to handle in the main function. Now, just as a final note, because you may come across it, there is a, another method on the promise object called promise.race, which does almost the same thing, apart from that it will work with the fetch that returns first, whether it's successful or not. So in practice, it's a lot less useful than promise.any, which works with the first successful promise. Usually you don't want to work with an unsuccessful promise, but it is useful to know that it exists in case you find yourself in a situation with a use case for it. So that is it for this tutorial on how you can work with the fastest of several batch requests to get data as fast as possible to the end user. Oh wow, my API was the fastest this time. I think that's the first time that that's happened. So I hope you found this tutorial useful. If you did, please consider hitting the like button down below this video. It helps us with the algorithm and others to find this video. And if you'd like to see more content like this from us in the future, don't forget you can subscribe to the channel.